But yes, wood is very much on my mind at the moment. But also, if you bought two lots of wood and then you couldn't use the second lot next year for whatever reason, um, you could sell it because it was a very, very valuable commodity. Yes, presumably, especially with seasoned. <laughs> or you could give it away as you were leaving in your leaving party. You could say to your friends that you've made out there, come and help yourself to a wheelbarrow full of my seasoned wood. <laughs> Welcome to Own It, your business and your life, with Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. In this podcast, we're going to cover everything you need to embrace to become a successful entrepreneur, marketing, money, and much, much more. How to create a business doing just what you love. How to own it, your business and your life. This one will be fast, funny, feisty, and very lively. So sit back and enjoy the show. Morning. Morning. Morning, Top Bird. How are you? I'm pretty well, thank you. Hello. Hey, we're back. We're back. We're better than ever. <laughs> oh, you might be bad. I don't think I'm bad. I'm a good girl, me. Oh, now, yeah. well, it, for the, so the last month's been all about the beach. Lovely. It's been about getting things done as quickly as possible and getting my little booty down the beach and, and having a lovely time. Swimming, I'm as brown as a button. <laughs> I did see a post that says, I think I'm as brown as it's advisable to be. There's no such thing as too brown. What are you talking about? Well, I think, I think everyone's got a brownness limit, and I think I've reached mine. Oh, well, you mean your body won't go any browner? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, yes, because yes, I'm, okay. I'm out in the sun every day now. And, well, I and think that's one's colouring, you're right, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's all good, and I felt very healthy because it's all fresh air and, and ozone and di- diving and snorkeling and walking up and down the beach and then walking down again and going across the showers. And uh, I've also been doing writing sprints because there's a big couple of right club ladies been around, so we've done things like get together and just write three three lots of 45 minutes, and that's resulted in another 2,500 words. Oh, good. Uh, but it's not – I mean, the writing is blooming hard work. I never had – I had no idea how hard writing was. <laughs> yeah, I did, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, didn't, I didn't get – I didn't get my um, – my, uh, into the CV. No, neither, neither you nor I got our, our wonderful yeah. dream that we had on the, uh, in the last episode, which was a shame. But I'm guessing you're over it, are you? Oh, yeah, I was over it by the, by the, the minute afterwards. But um, oh. there, there is another um, writing course I could apply to, Faber and Faber. Right. They do a one-year writing course, which is virtual, and it's with um, a really good uh, writer as a tutor. And Steph's done it. And she, but it's for, it's for Faber and Faber alumni of, of the first 15,000 words course. So, you know, I, they, they get precedence, and they only then take people from outside if you've got your first 15,000 words and, and they like it. Okay. So I'm trying so you to have decide. to submit your first fifteen thousand words. Do you? Yeah, 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 which I've got. Um, okay. I'm just trying to decide if I want to pay to do something. You know, and I think it'd be good for me in terms of accountability. I don't seem to be a. It's it's really weird, Judith. I'm the most motivated person I know, but this is one thing that I'm finding. I I, I it's do because it's hard, me. Nicola. It's because it's is hard. It? It's much harder to be. Uh, well, we resist writing. Uh, it's hard. That's why it really is hard. You know, when you read a really good book, if it's never occurred to you when when reading a really good book, gosh, this must have been hard to write. Then we weren't paying attention. And and the other thing is, I I wonder if I really want to do it. I mean, wouldn't I rather spend my time reading really good books rather than trying to write a really well, I think you have to do both if you want to be a writer. All my writing clients read really good books as well and call that work. Yes. Yes. And, and that's weird because I've always thought of reading as a treat. Well, so, quite. Yeah. But, 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 but reading is a treat at all levels. But we have to read harder books when we want to, to do well at the harder thing of writing, yeah. I think. Yeah. We have to look at books that have craft as opposed to just page turners, which we love. Yeah, you know? yeah pot boilers. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so you know, the long winter's evenings, we've got a week of rain coming up. So that's focusing my mind wonderfully on what am I going to do through the winter. And I think writing might be a good thing to do. Yes, I agree. And actually, I think it's a good thing to do for the rest of our lives anyway. It's in both of us. We wouldn't, we couldn't not. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Even if it's not published or not self-published or... I did read something very good. Oh, yes. There's a series coming on BBC One this autumn, which I've already watched, watched online. And it's written by... Well, it's adapted by 
Flea, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who's that woman that created that program called Fleabag, which I don't know if you've seen. I couldn't watch yeah. it because it was just too rude for me. But she's yeah. an extremely talented woman. She's an, a, an actress also in Star Wars. She's a writer. She's a performer. She's very, very talented young British woman. Yeah. But they're adapted from some high-selling, self-published Kindle novellas. Oh. And they're brilliant. Nice. So that's the first time I think I've ever seen where it says in the blurb, this man that created this novella self-published on Kindle and it was so good and so popular that the people, you know, the production company bought it up and then hired Phoebe to write the, the screenplay. Yeah. So and it's um, a proper collaborative thing. It's, it's got her fingerprints all over the writing, but the stories are his and they're brilliant. Oh. And the character is a woman. So a woman, a man has written a female, t- several, c- all the central characters are women and they're brilliant. Yes, and all, and all the, um, the Hugo Award winners, which is the sci-fi, you know, uh, thingy, uh, barometer of excellence, they've all been won by women this year. Oh, good. So, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, I don't know, it's the first time in my life I've ever had imposter syndrome and I, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't well, like it. No, no, I, I'm, I, you've probably forgotten the other time. This is a brand new thing and that's part of it a bit. But yeah. what I'm thinking of is there's an idea that's coming to me for you, which might work terribly well. They said when I was a young woman and I went to secretarial college, all the girls that were with me were posh, you know, yeah. and they were there on daddy's money. And they eventually went into underpaid careers like publishing. And so I used to know a lot of sort of blue stocking girls that worked in publishing for Peanuts. But um, one of them told me, and I don't disbelieve her, so I used to get all the secrets from the inside of publishing. She said Geoffrey Archer didn't write his own books, but he could, he could story, make a story like nobody else, and the publishing house would just fill in the words. So what about being a person who creates stories and partners with somebody who writes it, does the hard bit? Ooh, I bet you're brilliant at the storying. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a problem with the plot. That's for sure. No. Make the story and then do it in a twosome. That would give you accountability. Yes, that's true. That's true. That's what I need. I need accountability. Well, there's that's. I mean, there are several books, aren't there, that have been written in pairs. Well, you think yeah. of uh, Elton and Bernie Taupin. They write a song in a pair. Yes, that's very true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a very creative partnership that's lasted, I don't know, 50 years or something. Yeah. I, I've had, um, I've, I've discovered this resource called You Write On. Y-O-U, write, you know, the word right, mm. and yeah. then on. And it, dot com, and what you can do is you can upload bits of your novel or bits of your you know chapters or whatever, and anonymously you get you you go and get assigned um, other people's work to critique, and you give it scores on the doors. I think it scores out of fifteen five fifteen five well five fifteens. Anyway, it must add up to nearly a hundred or something, and um, and then they get they write fifty words or more about your about the impression you know they had of your work, oh, and wow. every time you critique someone else's, someone else critiques yours, and okay. every three months they open it up to um, you know you go into a chart that's uh, um, determined by the software and your scores, and then um, big publishing companies come and look and they critique the the top ten I think it is. And tell you know give and some some people have been picked up from this you know they've been picked up by publishing companies so I, I started I thought well that's good that'll get that'll get me going so I put it on and I've had five reviews so far two of which have been terrible <laughs> and um, so yeah I'm just trying to get to the seven reviews need to see if you get in the top ten charts you know why you would like that because it's got an element of gamification in yes, it yes I'm really quite impressed with this software it looks terrible it's very old fashioned looking but. Um, and I, d- I suspect they haven't got enough people doing reviews of people. You know, I don't get the impression there's an awful lot of people using this. So it might be new. So have you done some of your, you know, have you spread the word? Because we yes, know loads yes. of writers and readers yeah. between us, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a really good resource for writers. I really do. And, and how interesting you should bring that up. Because it, you mentioned the word critique, which is what our focus of the day is about today oh. with Alice. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, yes, it's all been about writing. What about you? What have you been up to? Oh, well. I've had a lovely, lovely, lovely long August off with lots of adventures, uh, including house-sitting my brother's house in Surrey for eight days, which enabled me to see London friends, some of whom I hadn't seen for anything between one year, four years and 13 years. I totally overdid it in London. I came back to the country feeling quite poorly. I put on my pyjamas. I got into bed for three to four days to recover. No word of a lie. I needed a day in bed for every two days I'd been in London. Um, My ankles were all swollen up and I'd annoying summer cold symptoms. Nicola, people are so germy. 
Germany, yes, when, yeah. especially when they gather together in, in lots well, of people. Well, like Germany, that. I felt, honestly, I felt at death's door when I got back here. I had to have a, I don't think it was, the, no, it wasn't, it was, it was a weekend in the middle, but for some unknown reason, I didn't have to do anything for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So I just put on my special pyjamas that I'd been saving. I don't know what I'd been saving them for, to be honest, but I thought, right, well, I'm going to use, I'll get my special pyjamas out and I will imbue them with magic, you know, qualities and I'll, I'll wear them and they will heal me. And it's approximately what happened. Um, so- what do you do when you go to bed like that? Do you just read and sleep? I was really quite poorly. I couldn't really have done anything very much except well, I was just I was just healing. I was trying to recover. Uh, and actually, what happened was, you know, as soon as I got back on my low carb diet, my ankles shrank to nothing again. I think, you know, if you have a a bed that you love, that you feel comfortable in, wherever it is, you know, and the one in London was not comfortable. It was firmer than I like it was wider than I like and the duvet was so heavy I could barely lift it using only my legs honestly (laughs) and uh, and it was upstairs and I'm not used to stairs and the house was lovely and I tell you what I learned from being being in an enormous house by myself when I'm on you know right right move house porn looking and making short lists of where I want to live and how I I think oh I don't need much space me but I was in this enormous house and apart from all the other bedrooms which of course I didn't use downstairs I used every single room I used the you know big kitchen my brother's study the enormous living room the you know the sort of relaxing end of the kitchen living room thing I could spread out if I had more space is what I learned about myself which I thought was quite fun I could use more living rooms actually rather than doing everything in the one room however big yeah okay Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? I thought you were going to say the opposite, but you don't need. I thought I was. I surprised myself. I love surprising myself. Anyway, let me tell you the rest of my month, uh, some of which will freak you a bit. And I'll come to those in a minute. So that weekend when I got back, I think it was about halfway through the month, eventually I put an out-of-office reply on my emails for the last two weeks of August. Not to get away from my clients because they're lovely. And lots of them were giving me a break anyway, whether I needed it or wanted it. I never need a break from them. I need a break from other ongoing business nonsense. And so I pretended I was um, not with reliable Wi-Fi moving around a lot for two weeks and that I would reply to them on the first Monday, which was uh, this week, the third. In fact, I did both of them on Saturday in the end, but I, I was stacking up things I didn't want to deal with, which isn't very much like me, but it was the only way to have a proper holiday in a way. Yeah. And in the last, last week, I had it completely off because uh, every now and again, where there's a five week month, I don't have to do my, my group calls for small business, big magic. So I had more, more time off last week. And as I said, just rested and healed. And I did watch the whole of Jack Ryan on Amazon Prime, which is, um, uh, made me feel a lot better. But in the middle, I did have three woo woo appointments. I think I'll oh. save. I think I'll save the best one. I'll I'll read them to you in the reverse order in which I've noted them down. So I had a, and in fact, the reverse order in which they happened. I had a visit last week to a woman, a local lady who douses for what homeopathic flower essences she should prescribe for you, and you put seven dots under your tongue twice a day or something i already knew she made this sleepy time mist because she sold it to my uh host here and there's some very reassuring snoring noises that come from my host's bedroom in the night so i knew the sleepy time (laughs) mist worked and holistic helen my beautician had said on the first visit have you been up to see this woman saskia and kath who listens to the podcast who's fascinated by all of this stuff said have you been to see the woman that she saw in a neighboring town i said no but i'm going to see this woman and she said oh i follow her on instagram she's fabulous so that was good feedback before I went and up there I went she lives on the top of this village which I had thought until that point was flat and when I got up there I went oh I didn't even know it was possible to be high in this village and it had all the views and daylight and sunshine that's missing from being down in the valley but anyway Mm. um she oh this is going to freak you I hope Sarah listens to this bit Sarah will love it um she had her pot plant wired up to a um a boombox, what do we call those things? You know, a ghetto blaster, her music yeah. machine centre thing. And it was playing music, the plant. The plant was playing music? Well, all plants have a vibration. If you go onto you, you, YouTube, you'll see people do this all the time. They put electrodes on the leaves and the plant's singing all the time. It's making tinkly little music. And it, it, it was rather sweet, actually. Uh, I got it straight away. I think there'd be quite a lot of people who would go, oh, I don't really get that. But there are big experiments going on all around the world. You know, everything's a vibration and an energy, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And you can record the vibration and the energy in an, in an audio output that comes. I don't know if you can do it from a table, but you can certainly do it from a plant because it's a living organism. Wow. I know. So that was fun. And then she prescribed, wait for it, 
what Kath has told me is a mighty mixture of dandelion seed, hornbeam, weld, wild garlic, wild rose, yarrow and mugwort. And I've been taking it ever since. I feel no different, to be honest. But, uh, <laughs> you, know, I love a you know, I love a little bit of I don't, homeopathy is a kind of a weird thing for me. I know people will write in and say, oh, no, Judith, it's marvellous. But um, it was just a lovely sort of fun out. It sounds good in Hogwartsy, so, you know. It's well, quite, yes. And then she told me what they all meant and it went in one ear and out the other. And I do have a brochure somewhere. But anyway, I mean, I'm very trusting. My friend, you know, my very sceptical friend called Nicola always says, you know, if Jane, my aromatherapist, said to jump off a tall building, I would. You know, if you wave a stick over me, it generally makes me better because I yeah. believe it will. Yeah. So I also had, when I was at my brother's, I had a consultation with a chap who I've spoken to before he calls himself a psychic life coach but I don't really think of him like that but he he, he had all all these consultations not all of them all of the time to be fair but all of the ones I've had this summer have been very nice and reassuring and uh but I'm telling them to you in the reverse order because the first one I had before I went to London was with a a medium uh, and I had, uh, and she's a client, a vague client, uh, by which I mean an ad hoc client, you know, not yeah. a regular one. And uh, she'd paid me a lot of money for a consultation. And then I saw her referring in her notes to her clients. And I thought, well, why don't I return the favour? So I paid her a small sum of money because these people totally undercharge. These consultations, yeah. I, I'm listening to you, are £40, £40 and £25. And they give you an hour to 90 minutes for that money. These holistic people do not know how to charge. But anyway, the psychic consultation, I had no expectations of. I didn't think before I went to it what it might mean. Anyway, I ended up talking to my dead mother. Oh. And the consultation inspired me later, without me putting it in my brain, to do a couple of things I hadn't even thought of before or during or after the consultation. And when they happened... I remembered the intel that had come to me during the session, not necessarily from my mother, um, but it was, uh, the three combined, well, you know, I love all of this, but the three of them combined were like three sides of a triangle, health, future, and... And what, sorry, what was the third thing? Oh, God, God, no. yeah. you, dis you disappeared, you said the three things, health, the future, and... My past, because my mother is my past, isn't she? Yeah. She's dead. So they're like the three sides of a, of a, of a holistic triangle, in a way. And yeah. uh, they, they, were, they were edifying. Um, I totally trust these, the, the place from which these people are coming. And uh, I totally believe that they are efficacious. And they brought forth various synchronicities and unexpected surprises it's like I caught myself doing things I mean I've no idea why I feel inspired to do this and then I went oh yes I do it was the consultation with you wasn't it and she said yes it was so fun well I'm just sitting here with, with my jaw on the floor really. I know you are but fortunately <laughs> some of the listeners will be more on my vibe than, about this than you but anyway there we go that's what I yeah. did with well you know as long as you're enjoying it and it feels I did I had enormous fun I did yeah. enormous fun yeah. about one a week I think oh okay hmm. And tell me about the chickens, because they went off to a spa, didn't they? Yes, the chickens went to a spa. I think my brother was being a bit funny, actually. Um, they, they, because, because they only thought of it on the Saturday before they wanted me on the Wednesday or Thursday, um, they'd already booked the chickens into a spa. Um, but I think he was being a bit sorry. I think they just go to like a cattery, not a cattery, obviously, whatever you call a henry. I don't know what they're called. But they do do things that my sister-in-law doesn't want to do, like they have to be treated with something for red mite, whatever that is. And it sounds like you have to sort of, a bit like talcum powder, only worse. Yeah. And you wouldn't want to have that on your hands or breathe it if you didn't know what you were doing. Yeah. So they had various, they get various treatments like that, that the, your average Surrey housewife does not want to perform on her own chickens. <laughs> but I wasn't sorry I didn't have to go out and put them to bed and things like that. Although yeah. when I sat in the garden with my brother and sister in law, the chickens seemed to just put themselves to bed. I, there was no putting the chickens to bed activity. So I don't know. Yeah, what no, that I would think have been. they can be trained at certain times. That huh. I think, well, I think dark, darkness trains them to go to bed, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I think they, they have a sense that, you know. Certainly might, nobody might. went off and put the chickens to bed. No, but you then have to close up the chicken thingy, don't you? Well, presumably. Yeah. Presumably. And fortunately, I didn't have to get involved with the chickens. They don't have any other pets. So, and then no house sitting was required, really. I just had to enjoy the place to myself, which was... Yeah. Lovely. And, and avail yourself of all the facilities. Well, yes, right. indeed. Ooh. 
So what's fueled your fire then? Well, even though it was my month off, I did do, as you might expect, half a dozen clients. And I also did six pay what you want calls where the average has now risen to £80 a call. And you'll remember that when we started, it was much lower than that. Mm. Um, People are really catching on to the value of working with me in this way. And I get to meet new people. One of them, as you know, is a famous musician because I told you about it halfway through the month. Uh And she was one of Charlotte's SEO results, i.e. she Googled and found me. Um, uh, An artist, presumably came via Alice. I expect she did. Alice always is a good referrer of artists. A professional carer with a USP that I really enjoyed. She looks after old people and she calls it intelligent care with conversation. I thought that was lovely. Yes. Uh, I could do intelligent care with conversation as long as it didn't require me to do any sort of physical care, but I could certainly visit old people and listen to them while they talk. She had a brilliant, brilliant thing going on. I really admired her a lot. A lady who runs a dance school was another SEO win. Thank you, Charlotte. And a brain box wordsmith who I've known or, or we've known of one another going back to the 30 day challenge. So let me just have a think about two Googles, two from Google, one from a referrer, two from probably Facebook. Yeah, no, no deliberate marketing activity in there. Um, just sort of um, word of mouth referrals and Google. Yeah, nice. Hmm. Well, you know, that means that you've put the work in in the Well, I haven't actually really done any marketing during, apart from my weekly newsletter, I haven't done any marketing in August. I had a holiday from that as well, really. Yeah, but you know, the SEO is, is work done in the past, isn't it? And, yes. and you've blogged so much and, you know. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. I wouldn't want to put that to the test, Nicola, I don't think. Um, although yesterday I had a an email via my contact form for a client who hasn't been a client for about three years. But, you know, I do those showcases sometimes where I feature all of my clients and a chap was looking for this woman whose business has long since shut down, several years shut down, and this woman's halfway through an MA in a completely unrelated topic. But yeah. he wanted to be connected with this woman. So even after your business ends, you shut your business down, marketing still comes in. I knew that already because I've been in real businesses in the past where long after you shut down, phones still ring. You know, you go past empty offices and the phones are ringing because people are trying to reach people as a result of historic marketing. Yeah, absolutely. Didn't you? Then you, it's you that says that it all takes two years for people to catch, catch up with what you're doing or not doing. Well, I think you you know you know the curve that we have of early adopters and yeah. and the rump and the tail enders. I do. If I think about people I know who cross their arms across their body when a new thing comes out and go, well, let's see. <laughs> they're about two years, if not more, behind the beat, aren't they? Yeah, I was watching Gary Vaynerchuk talking to some blockchain people recently and he said he was telling them how, you know, it was only 10 years ago he was sitting in a room full of old men in, in the wine industry going, uh, who were telling him that the internet was, wasn't gonna, was never going to last. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. I mean, the interesting thing is, um, when you look back, that looks silly. And certainly we wouldn't have said it was never going to last. But you could be in that room on another topic with something that hasn't lasted. And you can't tell in advance which are the ones that are going to survive and which ones aren't. No. No, he was also saying about, you know, CDs. and Whatever happened yeah. to CDs, they seemed yeah. like such a good idea at the time. And now, yeah. now I haven't well, even... They were, their, their lifespan was short, wasn't it, relatively speaking? It was, speaking. relatively speaking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, I think oh, vinyl God. lasted longer than a CD. Well, vinyl's making a comeback again. Well, I know. And perhaps CDs will, who knows. But but, but in our lifetime, CDs didn't last very long, did they? Got nothing I could play. Or DVDs, to be honest. No, you and I are streamers. I don't want any of that rubbish because we've got to cart it around with us if we do. Yeah, absolutely. You are dependent on the internet, though. So if that goes down, then you're back. It's back to. to Yeah, but you know, it goes down for a bit. And that's probably quite good for us, I think. Yeah, possibly. So, fueled by fire this week. Yes. As well, this month has been starting working with my new client, and I can reveal now that her website is called secretartofuna.com. And we are working. We are working on the website still. We're working on uh, creating a range of products, starting from one day workshops and moving up to five day retreats, and uh, VIP days, breakthrough days, and a membership site. So it's uh, the full the full Monty, as it as it were. And we've worked very well together for the last month. I've had a really lovely time. It's been really intuitive and nice. And now she's going off to Hawaii for a month, leaving me to sort, you know, finish everything off and, and get her membership site up and running. And, you know, it's just, it's just been a joy. It really has a real pleasure. And, uh, you know, running the ads and, and she talks to camera really well. And so that gives me lots of lovely stuff to work with. And it's just great fun. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. And she's a top bird as well, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, absolutely. And stepping mm. in, stepping into her power, as it were. Mm. 
So what is our focus of the week, Julie? Ah, yes. Well, we're going to feature Alice Sheridan, um, um, who's a London-based landscape artist. She now also mentors other artists. Uh, She's going to talk to us about criticism and critique, which is a couple of wordsmiths we both liked. We went, ooh. And uh, she taught us that people judge art in 2.7 seconds. Wow. I know. When you think how long they stand in front of a picture in a gallery, you know, if you go to the London Portrait Gallery or the National Gallery or something, people stand there for like 20 minutes. But uh, I, I tell you, I'm sure she's right because we know how quickly people judge a website faster than that, I think, don't they? Yeah. Anyway, she got us to think about the distinction between criticism and critique and she reminded us that the artist or the writer or the creator is often too close to our work to see it ourselves, but that when asking for feedback, it's advisable to frame the question very carefully. Not, and I say this to my clients all the time: don't just ask people what they think because there's a risk they might tell you. Yeah. But uh, she said, any tiny hint can be helpful, even if all it does is help you to work out what you think and feel as the artist. And that's something I very much agree with and try to offer to my clients. You know, enough thinking, talking, brainstorming to help them make up their own minds. I think that's what's useful about this whole process. Anyway, uh, let's listen to Alice, shall we? Yes. And here you are, Alice, the artist, who we talk about quite a lot on our show. (laughs) I haven't listened. I've listened to the first five minutes. Oh, no, no, not today's show. I mean, generally, we talk about you quite a lot on our show. That's because I've listened to one of them. Yeah, you're a minor celeb on the podcast. (laughs) I really don't, don't think I've ever missed one, so... No, well, you see, and neither had Reese. We're, we're loyal podcast listeners, Nicola. Yes, and, and now we're, we're rewarding them by actually featuring on the very thing that they listen to, which is... Yes, isn't that lovely? Now, Alice, for the benefit of those that don't know you, uh, just take a couple of minutes to talk about yourself and your art and your website, and then we'll come back to your topic. So my name's Alice Sheridan, and um, I trained and practised as a graphic designer because that was a proper job. And um, I came back to painting, um, painting initially as a, as a hobby and um, just kind of personal fulfillment. And then over the last few years, I've decided that I really do want to make it my proper thing um, that I don't regret having spent my life doing. So I'm here for the long haul. And the last three years or so, I've been working with Judith and it has really kind of transformed where I am. Um, and I am now matching my previous salary and wow. it's all just extending in front of me at the moment in ways that I didn't believe would be possible. So it's fantastic. It's interesting. I said to Alice the other day, very honestly, in ways that neither of us knew were possible, but no. actually in ways that you couldn't have done. Were you not a good artist, Alice? That's the point. So I don't want everybody to think, you know, if they're crap at drawing like me, that we could make a business out of being an artist. We're making a business out of you being an artist because you're good at art. <laughs> I think it's really interesting because everybody always has this idea, or lots of people have this idea that it's just about, it's just about the painting and it's just about the creativity. And I always had this ever since school, this balance between the creative side and a kind of like I did business studies at school that flipping between those two things I find really rewarding and when you can find a way to match them that's just totally satisfying because you get all your all your needs met in a way that I can still just flip I don't have a plan for the week I can go one day I feel like doing this the other day I feel like doing this and it works so and and actually I think you need both sides yeah you do you need both sides otherwise you could not create an income as an artist because you'd be too ambivalent about the commercial sides of it wouldn't you yeah you need to learn to fall in love with the commercial side I think and see that as part of the whole process yeah so for those of us who haven't got a clue how you would make a living as an artist, tell us the many and various ways that income can flow into an artistic person such as yourself. It, it's extending. So it starts with the work itself. And I think um, the first thing that was a real realisation for me was that if I carried on working at the size and scale that I was working, it was just never going to be possible. So, And that was good because creatively it propelled me into making bigger pieces as well. Um, And just being more um, decisive and clear. And again, the two things go hand in hand. You know, what kind of work is it that I want to make that feels exciting for people? And, you know, that's the kind of work that people are going to be prepared to pay for. And it's the kind of work that's going to get me off my, uh, into into the studio. (laughs) (laughs) So I, so the work itself, I think having things um, 
like I was encouraged into having prints made of my work for a company in the States, which was something that I'd resisted doing. Um, but selling those directly myself is a, is another great way. To, it's not quite as, as um, regular or even yet as I would like it to be, but that's a lower level for people. As the price of the paintings have got up, they can still yeah. you know, buy work. Um, and then just things come in from other sources. So I'm doing uh, a little bit of teaching this summer for the first time. I'm thinking about how that can grow. That's something, again, I've just waited to see that until I'm in a position where I know what I can really bring for people. But that's probably the next best thing that's exciting on the horizon as an additional. Is it private teaching or group teaching or, or teaching within the educational system? Well, this first one is within a school, which I'm really, it was funny, something came up a while ago for teaching seven-year-olds, and that, that kind of wasn't my bag, but this is a whole day with a group of six formers, oh. and I think the fact that they've really chosen to be there, but it's within an environment where they're not necessarily expecting um, a huge amount, you know, they're not expecting business, you know, we can really let rip and play, so I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm also supporting a group of people who are going through the Nicholas Wilton program that I did a couple of years ago. And um, I am loving that and watching them learn the stuff that I learned and being there to pick them up when they're pulling their hair out and kind of saying, I don't understand how this fits. How is this going to make sense? Now, that's an expensive that's program that you you invested in not easily I remember the decision making no. but it was transformative wasn't it absolutely yeah it yeah. totally changed things around I think um it it really changed my work and um I think that decision to do it in the first place which actually was very easy <laughs> uh, it was just the right thing at the right time yeah. but I'd never spent that much money on anything yeah at all and I couldn't quite believe that it would work and how could you teach from a distance like that um but but it's it's just been brilliant and I think it's just let me let go of so many preconceived ideas that I had about what I could do and what I couldn't do and now I could do anything yeah, yeah brilliant now what are we going to talk about Alice right we are going to talk about something that has the ability to completely stop us in our tracks or to propel us forward into something that's even better. And I spent a while thinking about this because I thought I don't want to do something that's too art related, but I want to bring some of that to you and have a crossover with people who are listening too. So the topic really is critique versus criticism. Oh. Yeah. Um, and I have... Sorry, Nicola, you might have to edit this a little yeah, bit. It's all right. I have my knife at the ready. <laughs> yeah, right. Make a note. Where are we five minutes in? 12.37, Nicola's time. Okay, here we go. I've got it. I was looking up a photo. So critique is a detailed analysis and assessment of something, especially uh, literary, philosophical or political theory, basically to evaluate something. And then criticism always has a much harder edge to it. For me I think um, but I think it is useful you know having a critique of your work is always something that's part of the process when you're at art school it's very it's different from the teaching it happens at the end it usually happens in a group format um, and it's a way of analyzing what you've done and reviewing but and according to your teacher it can be fairly brutal yes. and then the other type of thing that happens is when you get criticism of your work and it totally, it stops you. And I've kind of brought that down to a few things. It's, it's who is giving it to you, when in the process you're getting it, and therefore where you are in your own journey with whatever it is that you're working on, I think can make it particularly brutal. Um, I remember having a conversation with my dad one day, and it was the first big commission piece that I'd done. And... Um, he came up to the studio and he stood in silence for a while and he said, hmm, so tell me why you don't use oil paints again? And you know, in itself, it wasn't a harsh thing to say. It was a question. But it felt like, I don't get why you're doing that. It clearly isn't working in the paints that you're choosing. And, um, you know, 
it was just it, it it was very interesting how it was something that I received probably in a very different way than he intended. And don't you think that's to do with parents and children as much as anything? Yeah, very possibly. I think it is. I think I think um, I think it is. I think you know that they're looking out for you, so that you, there's always that feeling of them wanting to you to do your best. Whereas I've never had a problem. I remember the first time I did open studios. And a friend of mine said, well, what about all the people who come in and take one look and turn on their heels and leave? You know, that's, that's a real criticism. And I remember thinking, that is not going to bother me one bit because it's about people finding what they're interested in. And if they can make that decision very quickly and move on to the next artist, so much better. They're doing you a favour. I agree. Yeah. Not Whereas wasting think, your time. Yeah, I think some people, particularly at art fairs and things, they find that really hard, the fact that people can look. I think there was a study done at um, art galleries and people take 2.7 seconds to look at a piece of artwork before they move on. Yeah. And that's even if they stop. Yeah. You know, so learning how to deal with people's reactions to your work, and this is true in a business sense too, you know, how we de- how we deal with that, I think, is interesting. Um, and I think very often, you know, we do want to hear praise and praise is what keeps us going. And um, I know from my conversations with Judith that there have been times where if she had been critical, that would have stopped me. And the fact that you're purely encouraging, that's what keeps you going through a process that you don't know what you're going to get yet. Um, but equally, there's a time when you need to review and be a bit more self-critical of your own work. Mm-hmm. So I suppose the question that I want to bring to you is, in this group that I'm now working with, um, you know, and people are putting forward work for feedback. And it's quite difficult to know where they are in the process of where they, if if the right thing to give is praise and encouragement or something that is a bit more critical how can we as a person asking for the feedback let the person who is giving us the feedback know where we are in the cycle maybe you could ask I guess yeah because it's interesting if you don't know the person at all Uh, So if I hadn't known you and increasingly over the years wasn't able to judge, I mean, we haven't, we, I haven't just been blindly appreciating and praising. We've, we've had some tough things, but because I knew where you were, were, I, it was easier for me to know what you needed, but you, you don't know these people terribly well all of the time. You know them increasingly as you support them, but you don't know them straight off, do you? No, you don't. And I think that's one of the things with doing a bit more business online is often that you you miss out on, um, you know, the intonation or the things that you can hear in somebody's voice. Um, And, you know, even within this larger Facebook group that I now have, people will post images and they'll just say, here's this, what do you think? Oh, God, that's a difficult question. What do you think? Nicola, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, as you know, I'm in a writing group now and we yeah. critique each other's work all the time. And one of the goals was, was when joining was to be, um, to, to be a couple of people are a little less thick skinned. I'm a very thick skinned person. I don't care what anyone else thinks, but I, I do welcome critique because it, when they say things like, "Oh, you, you know, you missed, you changed the point of view there," or "Or did you know you're you know you're using too many adverbs?" You know, think writerly things that I don't know anything about really. So that's that's really useful for me because it's teaching me as I go along. But I'm actually doing the thing, which is the writing, and it's not stopping me in my tracks, as you say. If somebody had said, you know. If, some, if somebody was ha- harsh, we're never harsh to each other. We're always encouraging and supportive. And in a way, you have to do that thing of finding something nice to say and then saying the thing that you think needs saying. Yes. Feedback sandwich. Yes, yeah, that's, sandwich. Yeah. that's what I've heard. Feedback it's sandwich, <laughs> yes. But, um, I, I, I think, well, I think two things. I'm too, I'm too fragile for it, but it is the breakfast of champions, isn't it? And, and my brother, you know, a corporate executive, would say it's the only way to improve. Yes. Well, I mean, 
Yeah, so this is what I think. I think otherwise you just stay in the same, you know, if somebody isn't going yes. to be able to um, throw some kind of spotlight on the one main thing that you're really, that's really holding you back. Yeah. If you're too close to the work that you're doing and yes. you can't see that for yourself. Yes. You know, you have to be, you have to be in a position where you can, hear it even if that means perhaps that you take a little bit of time to withdraw and think about it and then come back in, and, you know, if somebody looked at my website and they just said it's just wrong you've got the wrong you've got the wrong image on the front page or you know there's no how anyone I mean so I was I was just about to suppose in, in business it's easy because you can test and nobody can say mm-hmm whether one image is right or not it's it's purely a thing of which image on gets the most click throughs to the next page you know you can test you don't need to take an artistic stance on it and and really the whole testing thing and iterating till you get better and better and better sets you free creatively because it means that nothing is right or wrong it just is and it works or it doesn't work Uh, and actually alice likes that don't you alice I'm not so good. I'm not yeah, so but you're good. Qu- you're quite good on the techie side. You are. You do fiddle with that website to get it to work better for yourself all the time. You do. I do, but I'm judging it against what I what feels right for me. I'm not very good at testing it in the no. way that I know that Nicola would test it. No. But I think I do like approaching things as an experiment. Yes. And just seeing, you know, so testing it from that point of view. So what would happen if I do this or if I try yeah. doing this. Or I mean, if back, I to, back, back to your main question about how to give feedback to the people in the group because you don't know what stage they're at. In, t- in coaching, I wrote this at the very end of my book and probably neither of you made it to the very last sentence, but in coaching, it's called holding up the mirror. And yeah. it's so the other person can see themselves. And it's a really scary thing to do as a coach but it's what a brave coach does but you don't bang them over the head with it you offer them something so they can see it themselves give us an example yes. of how you go about that oh god it's hard um you know it wouldn't be hard for me with Alice because I know her really well and I know and even if she burst into tears it wouldn't matter to me and it wouldn't be about the art because I know nothing about art it would it would um I can't think of a good example in Alice's case but it's quite subtle it's questioning I think it's questioning that's questioning that's what I've come to is is it's uh and prompts so it's it's not telling yeah and also just giving your reaction and making it clear that that is your personal reaction, which yes. as, as you say, Nicola, it isn't a right or a wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I'm looking at this and it makes me confused or I don't understand what the next steps are. And then the person can interpret from that, you know, what, what they want to make of that. And again, it's the, it's the same thing. There's always this crossover between whether it's you're working in your work or whether you're, you're looking at, you know, what you're saying in your emails to people or how you're having conversations with people at exhibitions. Um, If I go back to your two words, which are gorgeous, of course, critique and criticism. Mm -hmm. Critique, to me, holds out the potential to be helpful and criticism the potential to be destructive. Yeah, there's there's very definitely a harshness in criticism, isn't there? Yeah. And also, if I think back over the years to crits, you know, of when I was in a, an accountant to restaurants, a critic could just come along and destroy all the good work that anybody had done. And, you know, what was his name? What was his name? The brilliant guy, A.A. A. Gill. He wrote like a dream, but he could just oh, yeah. destroy people's businesses and television programs and artistic output in their creativity in the telly. The telly in restaurants was what he critiqued. And he wrote beautifully. But, oh, boy, did I feel sorry for the people that he was destroying all yeah. the time. Well, and quite often often I've enjoyed restaurants and films that have been criticised by the critics. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think they're not critiquing. The, the very word critique means that you're, you're offering something that will help the person improve, whereas the word yeah. criticism just is... One well, of- I think that's Alice's answer. Yeah. Your goal must always been, be to help them improve, even if you need to qualify that for a few times. Yeah. So as long as your intention is yes. totally clear, yes, and your and, your and pure, think, actually, yes. So I think that that's why I've been very careful about about um, doing this before I feel that it's ready. Is and I'm taking um, Stu McLaren's tribe course at the moment, mm. and there's so many things that he's talking about that just feel right in terms of 
setting up the space right for people yes so that they can be honest and um feel supportive and know they're in a place of trust and I think it's very interesting how all the people that I've chosen to work with along the way and I pick very very Judith no I pick very carefully yep. I don't jump on all the bandwagon of things but everybody who I've chosen to work with and help me along my journey has that same approach and you can and recognize all, it all the proper professional trainers I've ever worked with for any meeting and any training space will always set up those rules in the beginning so everybody knows in the room what what where the boundary is that you and if you step over it they'll take you aside and ask you not to behave like that yeah <laughs> and yeah. I often say in a Facebook group if it's my opinion this is my opinion please feel free to ignore it at will you know. I think, and I think that's the other thing that's very interesting is very often when there's something that's coming as a as as feedback or critique or criticism, it's noticing how you respond to it that shows you that either whether it's important or relevant to you. Yeah. yeah. If you're very if you're very defensive about it. Yeah. That, that probably shows something. Yes, it does. Um, you know, if if. And I think it is sometimes quite hard to do for yourself when you're too close. So just having your antennae up and listening for those things which set you off or um you know that you or things that you can dismiss easily or things that you take to heart and you just know whether it's the right time or not for you to listen to it but i think there and there is a time for exploring and then there is a time for stepping back and learning in a little bit more of a reflective way and I think any kind what you've made me realize today is that any kind of incoming thought or um feedback or criticism or anything I've got the opportunity to go right is this critique brackets valuable or criticism not so valuable and the other two things as you mentioned earlier Alice is is um when you talk about who where's it coming from because the one yeah. thing that winds me up faster than anything is people <laughs> offering a, opinions when they're not actually doing anything themselves Yes, yeah. so I have to really talk myself down from that one. But then, then the final thing to remember is that if you ask people for an opinion, it will often what they come back with will often oft be negative because they they think you want um, they 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 think you want criticism, whereas actually you're asking for critique. But so they, actually, it behoves us to ask for the right thing then. Absolutely, I think that's really important. I think being and that's what in the big art explorers group. That's what I'm trying to to encourage people to do. I say if you you know if you're posting an image of your work, it's great to see it. But if you're asking for feedback, and also let us know what stage you're at with it. Yes. Is this something that you think is finished, or are you in the middle and you're stuck with a particular part? Yeah. Because that gives people a really good steer on what they can say to you that yeah. may, or may not be helpful, which is then... So th that question, what do you think, is just too imprecise, isn't it? Yes, yeah. totally. So it's about being sp asking specific questions. Yeah, I, know, I advise throughout my book, don't ask people what they think because they'll tell you. But actually, <laughs> that's not the same as don't ask for critique, don't ask for specific... You know, you, well, you've seen in our mutual groups, Alice, if you ask people what they think, they just split the vote right down the middle. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I like the pink, I like the blue. Oh, how useful but is that? Not but even then, I find that that's quite an interesting decision-making process because if, if you ask people pink or blue and they say pink and you think, oh, no, then, you know. Yes, I agree. Yes, yeah. it's the yes-no button. I will tell you that um, you you think critically I don't mean in the negative sense I mean you're a critical thinker you know what I mean by that yeah. and yeah. you're actually one of my biggest critics in a positive way you're always telling me like um you're not a mechanic but mechanics always tell us creators where we got it wrong what what detail we didn't think about you you often offer that and I sometimes am a bit stung and I think oh and this is being a bit mean to me I know that's not your intention but you always tell me where I've missed something out or I've been you know when I said you know I think I'm going to monetize my newsletter so I won't pay for your newsletter you know but I'm not hurt by it because I know you really well uh, even though I'm a self-confessed don't like feedback merchant yeah I and I think it's something that you know my brain always jumps yeah. to yeah. What can I do better here? What can yes. I do better here? And yes. I know that I have to. Is that exhausting? I think I would find that if it was always leaping to what could I do better, I think uh, I would find that when's enough enough? I'm practicing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really trying to practice that. And yeah. again, you know, I've learned that through the painting. There was definitely a stage where I just thought every painting has to be perfect. And I kind of thought, y y y 
you know, nobody has done that. No, no artist in the history of forever has said, you know, this is my lifetime's work. It is one painting. My work it's, here is done. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it, it's always a progression and a journey. So now with each painting, I'm just trying to get to each stage of, you know, what was this painting about? And is there enough in here that is of interest so that it is enough? Um, so I, I will be very interested to see how that affects all those all those other things and I think quite often now I, I get away from it by saying to myself this is good enough for now yeah and I, th I think of course the and I would because I'm not so arty as you but I feel it's harder in your field than almost any oh, well no I mean anything anything like sort of writing is the same because it's on my side it's sub subjective on the on the consumption yeah. side the consumer side it's subjective isn't it Perfect for who was the question yeah. to my mind. It might yeah. be perfect for you, but it might be perfect for me. I mean, and actually, when they buy it, Alice, there's your answer, isn't it? Yeah. It was good enough. There, there is. And there's been some funny discussions this week as well at, um, with people saying, you know, I went to somebody's house this week and they bought one of my paintings from four years ago. And it's like, it's awful. And I want to take it back and give her a refund. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but isn't that just that the, the consumer, the buyer of that is four years behind in their, uh, their own um, art, RT appreciation journey? Well, I think it goes back to everything that we always say, which is that people buy whenever they buy for whatever reasons they yeah. buy for. And yeah. it was it, she was perfectly happy with it at the time and probably still is perfectly happy with it. Otherwise, it would no longer still be hanging on the wall. It's yeah. just that we've changed. So our own sense of yes. self-criticism has moved on and become more fine-tuned. And, yes. you know, that's why you can go back to these things. You know, it isn't a kind of one stop and then it's done, is it? You can carry on reviewing. But No. Well, uh, thank you for this. We've got to bump you off because we've got another one coming up now. But critique versus criticism, an absolutely riveting concept, isn't it? It is. And, and as a wordsmith, I'm appreciating the difference between the two words as well. It's a distinction, as Thomas Leonard would have said. Yeah. Love well, it. I won't show you a picture of all my scribbly notes of what we could have discussed. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, is, once, once, once we butt into what you're talking about, it doesn't go the way you expect, unfortunately. Well, I thought when, when we got that one, I thought Judith will like that. Here we yeah. Go. Yeah. go. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Love you. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy you. See you soon. Bye. 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 Well, um, speaking of top birds, as we were in um, What's Fueled Your Fire, there's another one in Focus of the Week. Yes, and I've actually mentioned Alice quite a lot this last month because I've met people out here who are very creative. Um, particularly, there was a photographer chap who um, I wanted to show show him someone who markets themselves very well. Yeah. I mentioned Alice and also sent him a link to her website, which is lovely. Yeah. And who was the um, client? Was it a client of yours who did the did an art auction on, on Instagram of their work, 100 pieces. Yes, yes, it was Lottie, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. And, and so I wanted to send him to her. Oh, actually, she sent me a message telling me how well that had gone as well. Well, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, I was a bit intrigued. I did send her a message saying I'm a bit intrigued by your pricing because it's, you know, it's sort of, um, she'd, she'd obviously started the bidding at, at certain pr um, paintings higher. And I did find 100 a bit overwhelming. I found it very difficult to choose. Uh, but you know, generally th speaking, I thought it was an absolutely fantastic idea. Yeah. And did you get rid of a lot of um, back pi back pictures? Cleared out a lot of space in her studio. I don't think that she has a studio in the sense that Alice does. Um, Lottie's a, a, a multi creative person, and you know, having done those pictures and put them up there, she may never do art ever again. I wouldn't. She's not necessarily an artist. She's also a writer. She's also a mother. She also, um, I think, it's common knowledge because she puts it every week in her newsletter and everything. Is she struggles with mental health issues? So you, you I'm not sure. I know she doesn't have a studio, and oh. I don't think she has a backlog. She created it. She sold it. She might well, never do art ever again. She's a, she's a very interesting, well, she's a creator more yeah, than an artist. Yeah, yeah. But I, I caught one of Alice's um, videos recently where she showed herself starting to work on a, bro on a project. I thought that was really incredibly yeah. good, good marketing. Yeah, it? and, and she's good on camera, isn't she? Yes, very much yeah. so. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Okay, so what is your word of the week? Well, I've got one in here, and 
I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you what it means. But I can no longer remember why I put this word on the sheet because I did it six <laughs> weeks ago. So I clearly found this word before our holidays and put it. I mean, I, I'd heard of this word before. But I anyway, autodidact, which means a self-taught person. I think we must have been talking about being self-taught at the end of the of July. Yeah. And uh, then I saw the word uh, for it. Um, and actually, it sounds rather nasty. Autodidact. It sounds it sounds like you're a dictator, but it's not. It's a self-taught person. Oh, very good. Well, my word is wood, because it's coming to that time of the year. Do you mean like Sarah's marital surname, or no, no, I mean... burning wood, or wood? W O U L D. It's coming to the season. It's coming to the time of the year where oh, you're not yes. getting your pile of wood in. Yes, and um, and I've just had a conversation, a very funny conversation with Stella, my my local fi- Mrs. Fix It, and she said. Well, really, you want seasoned wood because you're your wood burning stove. I said, well, yes, that's what I'm trying to order. It. She said, well, no, not many people have got wood from last year left now. And I said, well, how, how do you get seasoned wood if nobody's got the wood from last year? And she said, well, you might have to talk to um, Tony up the hill. I think he's got a lot of last year's wood still knocking about. I said, so are you saying that I should order some wood for this year and order some wood for next yeah, year? Yeah, that would be my logical conclusion. Yeah. So and then keep the second batch somewhere hidden. <laughs> Well, you keep it under undercover. That's where yeah. you keep it. And yeah. um, so I'm thinking that's what I might need to do. Yes. But um, I do remember... But you're talking... planning ahead. You'll still be in stupid this time next year, will you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think Ooh. I'll be in for a couple of years, yeah. Oh, you're putting down roots, Nicola. Buying next year's wood now. Well, it all depends what happens um, next year, doesn't it, in, in Brexit. I went to see um, an account, a local accountant recently about things like, you know, residency and, and tax permits and all that business. And... Um, and how long you can stay without either. And it's all going to be, it's all going to change next year. So she said, basically, don't do anything right now. Just wait and see what, next, what happens next yeah. year. Yeah. So, uh, but yes, wood is very much on my mind at the moment. But also, if you bought two lots of wood and then you couldn't use the second lot next year for whatever reason, um, you could sell it because it was a very, very valuable commodity. Yes, presumably, especially with seasoned. <laughs> or you could give it away as you were leaving in your leaving party. You could say to your friends that you've made out there, come and help yourself to a wheelbarrow full of my seasoned wood. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Could be your farewell gift if you have my, to leave. My to farewell life. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. So what about, what about projects then? What are you thinking about going forward? Nothing, but oh. I will tell you that my September low carb group is already underway. I wanted 10 people. I've got nine so far. I've got room for one more on top and they don't need to start until the 25th of September because then they've got three months until Christmas Day. That's the same time of year that I started two years ago. It's a good time of year to start. This time, having done the pilot, well, not, we're actually only two thirds of the way through the pilot, but I upped the price and cut down the number of Zoom calls. I'm tweaking it slightly each time to create a tiny but invisible system around inductions and content more for me to have a process to follow than for their client experience because uh, I don't like anything to be systemized from the client's perspective even in a group I want to treat them like valuable individuals which of course they are especially to me so my project uh, my projects at the moment are uh, tidying up the July pilot technically that should be July August and September but it will run into October because of the late starters and this one will do the same September October November and will run into all the way up to Christmas too because of the late starters but I, I don't have anything new in mind and I don't want anything new I've got enough on my plate thank you very much mm-hmm, yeah. what about you um, I, I imagine you've got one or two well you know I'm trying to keep it down to be honest because there's quite a lot going on around here as, as you'll hear next week um, but I have saw, I have changed to a thing called Thrivecart, which is a it sort of sits in between your membership site and your products and your mailing list and everything. You know, in the same way that Shopping Cart did, and PayPal indeed does now. But it's got a few more um, bells and whistles than PayPal, i.e., attaches to Stripe as well, so your your customers could choose whether to use PayPal as a payment gateway or um, pay by credit card. And then they, it gives them a customer center. So, for example, if they, you know, the credit card expires and they're in the middle of a membership, it will give them a, um, a notice that, to that effect. and They can go and update their own card without me being involved. And it also switches the membership on and off. So, and it's a, a one-off, one-off lifetime payment of $600, which I think is incredibly oh, reasonable. Okay. You can actually pay for it a monthly, which is $97. So, obviously, $600 for a, a lifetime license is a really good deal. So, 97 would be forever or 600 one-off? 97, yes, 97 a month forever, uh, as long yeah. as you're using it, or 600 and something. Oh, bargain. I know, that's what I thought. But yeah. obviously it's a big investment. I also yes. want to make sure that I, 
absolutely needed it. I've, I've been running my membership site manually for a year now, you know, putting people in manually and taking them out manually. Um, but, you know, I am getting to the stage now where if someone joins up in the middle of the night and they don't get an immediate yeah. username and password, they sort of get yeah. a bit twitchy. And um, so did you use it for a month or three at 97 before you bought it at 600? Uh, no, no, because it's quite a lot of work to change over. So you've got okay. to make the decision to do it. Okay. But, you've and got I, to make the decision before you know if you'll like it. Yeah, I sort of knew I'd like it because I'd, I'd seen it in other people's um, yeah. thing. And I oh, I wanted to use it for, for this new client. So I thought this is a good time for me to swap as well because it will yes. make, make me learn it inside yes. out if I'm using yes. it. So. Yes, yes, yes. And it also has the ability to run your affiliate program for you. Um, yes. I've yet to find out how to do that, but I know it can do it. So yeah. We're back to being, you know, because I definitely know my client wants an affiliate program. So um, yeah. I thought I would. And then funnily enough, one of my members asked me if, if they could recommend people to me through an affiliate link. So it's a good time to do it. Yes. And it's called Thrivecart. And if anyone wants to get the link for this um, one-off lifetime payment, uh, it's, it's a developer-only offer. So um, I can, you know, just email. So do you want to give it to me for me to put it in the show notes then? No, I don't. I want people to email me. Okay. So email me if you're interested. Okay. And that's pretty much it on the project front. Okay. More to tell you next week then. I had heard of Thrivecart actually. Yeah. Mm. So who or what's impressed? Well, my favourite actor of all time is Robert Redford. And he's Uh, announced that now that he's in his 80s, he's retiring from acting because there's too much waiting around but not from directing. And from that, I took it to mean that at at that stage of life, life is too precious to be waiting around at some other's behest, but not to be cracking on with your own creative pursuits, which I thought was quite inspiring in a way. And his last film in which he's an actor is just about to come out at the end of this month, and it's called The Old Man and the Gun. haven't seen it yet, but excited. So during August, I staged my own personal retrospective of his movies. (laughs) And I'm up to 10 of them, although he's acted in 78, according to IMDb, so I've got plenty to go yet. But the first one I ever saw him in, and the, my brother and I went to the cinema when we were, I think, 14 and 12 together to Leicester Square, which is where you used to go in those days, to see Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And he was Sundance, obviously. 1969 it was. I never looked back. But what I like about him is that he's a liberal activist and a friend of the arts, especially, you know, having created his own film festival called Sundance in Utah every year. Yeah. And uh, of the 10 films I've watched so far, which is my favourite? Oh, God, that's so hard. If I'd had to plump. Oh, it's much too hard. Out of Africa, The Horse Whisper and All the President's Men are my top three, but I wouldn't want to pick one. Uh, I couldn't pick one. They're all good in different ways. He's marvellous. Yeah, absolutely. I remember some Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. There was a lot of humour in that, wasn't there? Well, every time I watch it again, I always hope it'll end differently because they die in a hail of bullets at the end. No spoiler there since the film yeah. is, I don't know, 111 years old. But um, <laughs> I, I always hope they, they will survive. But as each time I watch it, it's more and more obvious, sooner and sooner into the film, that this, they're on a hiding to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like Thelma and Louise, isn't it? They're, yes, it is, yes. So, yeah, those things have to, have to go one way. Yes, they do, yeah. Well, I'm hoping that I've got something that's going to give you a lot of pleasure now, Julie. Oh, good. Um, one of the things we do in the Right Club, the podcast, is we interview up-and-coming authors. And we came, came across um, a new author called Sam Blake. And she's Irish. And she writes um, crime thrillers, police procedurals, with a heroine called Kath Connolly, who is brilliant. Oh, good. And she, there's three books. The first one is Little Bones, I'm halfway through it, and two of the Right Club ladies are halfway through the book two because they have to start book two immediately after finishing book one. Oh, good. And they are such good, it's such good writing, it's such good plotting, the, the secondary characters are fantastic, you're going to absolutely love it. It's oh, so ready. In Ireland. So ready for a new book, and, and oh, three yeah. is good. You know, when you hear a new author and they've got 22, that's a bit of a gulp, but oh, three is marvellous. Yeah. Very strong heroine. We interviewed her yeah, the other day. And her heroine's a kickboxer. So this woman went and actually learned how to be a kickboxer, how to oh do kickboxing. That's, that's impressive, isn't Dedicated, it? A method writing, as I said to her. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to love it. Little Bones by Sam Blake. Okay. And I think it might even be free on Kindle right this Redbox second. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, There's go check it out, people. Again. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's us, Sen. It is. We're back. Yep. We've been good. Yes, <laughs> and we're back again in about five minutes. How long yeah. should we give it to turn around? Five minutes. Okay, see you soon. Bye. Bye.
You've been listening to Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. The podcast is called Own It, Your Business and Your Life. Do come and visit us at ownitthepodcast.com. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can find out more about Judith and visit her on her website at judithmorgan.com and you can find Nicola at nicolacairncross.com.